polls and said exactly what you just said, almost word for word, because it is just the truth. Neither one of you is plagiarizing the other. It's just the truth. And they are calling him basically a KGB agent. Uh, they are uh, demonizing uh, me for it. We just lost the Skype. We're going to get him back up. It is insane to sit here and watch this. And, and you talk about radical Islam cascading around the world. What is the larger plan? That's what I want to ask George Galloway, uh, again, a member of the uh, Respect Party from Bradford West in the United Kingdom. And we're going to be talking about some about that party as well today. Uh, again, folks, a new Cold War being launched right now. A new Cold War being expanded, and uh, George just basically uh, broke down the hypocrisy of 11 years later what has happened with Iraq. And if his Skype's not working, guys, just go to telephone, back up. We're going to telephone right now. Good. All right. It was bad Skype anyways, but it was good to be able to see him, even though it looked like we were looking at him through a fog. And that's the beauty of Skype and these uh, technologies that are not yet perfected, but they still it, it still is amazing to be able to talk to anybody we want. Uh, across the world and and it 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 is the hypocrisy of people like John Kerry that is so staggeringly ridiculous you think it's Dr. Strangelove satire to have him saying you can't just go around you know invading countries when the Russians are grabbing a small area that's pretty much always been part of Russia uh, to secure their pipelines now now sir continuing uh, you were getting into Iraq and the cascading radical Islam. Is there a method to the madness in Syria, in Libya? Because, I mean, this looks like something the devil would do uh, yes. to, 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 to just to try to wreck any stability. What's the game plan? Well, I wish I knew. I shared a lift with William Hague, the British foreign minister, uh, just uh, a week or two ago. And I said to him, William, you've been wrong all of your life but I've never known you to be actually insane. Yet the policy you're following in Syria is literally insane. You have inflated, financed, and armed Al-Qaeda in Syria on the principle that your enemy's enemy was your friend. Yet now you tell us that returning fanatics coming back from Syria, now that they're losing the war, are Britain's number one security concern. So you've made more dangerous the very people that you say are our number one national security threat. This has to be defined as insanity, doesn't it? It is, and, and I've, I've been following politics for decades, but never have seen something this surreal. Again, George Galloway, member of UK Parliament, one of the most outspoken people in Europe, not just England, against all these wars, proven absolutely right about Iraq in spades. Uh, where is it going as, as the open mental illness, the fascist mental illness, just explodes and metastasizes? Well, it is uh, metastasizing. That's a very good uh, image to conjure up. And it is a cancer that has spread all over the world. And I said this to Tony Blair, man to man, outside the gentleman's lavatory, to be precise, in the library corridor of the House of Commons, just a few days before he and George Bush invaded Iraq. I told him, I think, four or five things. Number one, there is no Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But if you invade it, there will be hundreds of thousands of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Number two, the fall of Baghdad will not be the beginning of the end, but merely the end of the beginning. Number three, the Iraqis will not welcome you with flowers. They will walk, welcome you with hot lead and fire. And number four, to believe that Iraqis would welcome a foreign invasion of their country means that you think they love their country less than we love ours. Because Nobody in Britain or the United States would dream of welcoming a foreign invader and occupier to their country. And lastly, I said that though there is no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, if you invade, Al-Qaeda will be everywhere. It will spread everywhere, like a cancer, metastasizing, as you say, all over the globe, because you will fanaticize, radicalize, extremize, millions and millions of Muslims 
who can see the grotesque double standard that you are practicing. Your best friends in the region are the worst dictators in the region. You are supporting those tyrants, giving them money and weapons where they need them, and you're supporting Israel, which has for more than 60 years wiped off the map the country that used to be called Palestine and scattered their millions of people all over the globe. And any way you cut it, it's meant to radicalize uh, Islam and, and in the final equation, destabilize the whole region. You've been really accurate predicting what would unfold. What do you predict will unfold now in Syria, uh, in Libya, all over the place where the Al-Qaeda jihadis are running around? And, and now, as you mentioned, your government, other governments are saying brace for Al-Qaeda to attack with surface-to-air missiles that they got in Benghazi. And there's no discussion of why were they given this? I mean, clearly they're helping create the threat to then set up a police state continent-wide, uh, UK-wide, US-wide. Looks to me like they want to use this Al-Qaeda threat that they're funding and supporting to take our liberties. Well, up to a point. But the point about the Frankenstein analogy that I keep making is that once you've made the monster, it quickly moves, moves out of your control. And we found that in the 1980s in Afghanistan, when on the same immoral principle, that my enemy's enemy is my friend, we supported the fathers of these current extremists in the so-called Mujahideen in Afghanistan. We gave them guns, we gave them money, which they later deployed against us, and most uh, atrociously uh, in the United States of America, but also in London, in Madrid, and elsewhere. So. The point about Frankenstein is you've got to read it to the end, because you then realize that Dr. Frankenstein's monster turned on his creator. And uh, whilst a bit of a threat of fanaticism or communism or Russia can be useful to the military industrial complex, to the security state apparatuses who wish to uh, bolster their budgets, give themselves more power, and centrality in the state, only up to a point. Because once you've made this enemy more powerful, as we've done with the fanatics, then you are in very real and present danger from them. They have come up, though, against some serious reality. The Syrian people have rejected their uh, jihad. They have stuck by their regime, even where they may hate their regime. And there are many good reasons to hate the Syrian regime. But the Syrian people will never agree to live under an Islamist code that owes more to bin Laden, owes more to Afghanistan than it ever could to a sophisticated, civilized, Levantine population where people mix men and women, Christians and Muslims, where the minority religions are protected and cherished and so on. And that's the way the majority of people in Syria want it to continue. So they have stuck by their government. The state has not broken. The army has not broken. And they are winning success after success on the battlefield. But that, of course, means that these fanatics are now beginning to return from whence they came. And whence did they come? Your country, my country, other European countries were now blooded and with the skills of four years of terrorist war, they'll be looking for targets in our own countries well, sure. to attack. Well, sure. L Libya is another example that you have raised a couple of times. They painted Gaddafi as a foolish, brutal, idiotic dictator, and he was. But they have managed, with an act of genius, to make Libya worse under their so-called liberators. And they admit that. Than it was under Gaddafi. Just like Iraq. And they're all murdering each other in large numbers. They're kidnapping the prime minister, forcing him from office, murdering the American ambassador in Benghazi, killing each other, killing anyone that they can get their hands on. And now there's not one Libya but three 
Soon there'll be 33. What is wrong with these Al-Qaeda people? I mean, why are they just so insane and nasty? Well, Al-Qaeda's mentality is rooted in and based on the narrowest possible, most sectarian interpretation of Islam that is possible to imagine. And anybody who doesn't share this uh, dogmatic, tiny, narrow uh, interpretation of Islam is an apostate who must be killed. Uh, that's just other Muslims, by the way. Never mind when it comes to Christians or Jews or non-believers. Uh, all of them uh, have to go. And so this narrow interpretation of Islam is supported in only one place on the earth. Saudi Arabia. And that's Saudi Arabia. And guess what? Saudi Arabia is your country and my country's best friend. Prince Charles was there just the other week, done up like an Arab sheikh with a sword in his hand, doing a sword dance. The very kind of sword that's cutting off people's heads. Christian clerics included. In Syria. Bishops included in Syria, having already stampeded virtually all of the Christians in Iraq out of their country uh, for fear of their lives. That's right. So That's it's right. one of the great puzzles of all time, how your country could be back in bed with Al-Qaeda after everything that's happened over the last decade. All the it is incredible. It, you know, it, it, it's so insane, George Galloway, that I can't even believe it. No, it's very hard to believe. But the blood and treasure of young American servicemen and women and British servicemen and women and your taxpayers and mine have been expended in the trillions of dollars in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda when we are now arming and funding Al-Qaeda in Syria. As I say, you couldn't make that up. In fact, I'm somewhat of a history buff. I can't think of really a lot of examples or really any historically except for 1984, and that's fiction, where you're always at war with East Asia, and the next day you're never at war with East Asia. It is that crazy. So looking forward, because you made a lot of accurate predictions, I've read your writings and you know, watched you when you're in Parliament. Uh, I mean, it's always informative. Where do you see this going, and will the political class pay any price on the left and the right for the war crimes that have been committed here, and, and, and now the new war crimes of turning Al-Qaeda loose. I know you're working towards punishing those, those war crimes with a lot of courage. Uh, break that down. Well, I, I, I'm now making a movie called The Killing of Tony Blair. It's not a snuff movie. It doesn't involve me killing Tony Blair, though that would probably be quite a popular movie. It's about the killings of Tony Blair, the killings carried out by Tony Blair, and the financial killing that he is making as a result of the other killings that he had been doing. And so I hope that we'll get him sacked as the Middle East peace envoy, the most grotesque appointment since Caligula appointed his horse <laughs> as a proconsul of Rome. I hope that it will stop companies from hiring him. He's made more than 75 million pounds, so $100 million since leaving office working for the tyrants and the companies that he so handsomely profited and benefited when he was in office. And I'm about to start making a movie to try and punish the American political class. It's called Where's Kenny Boy? It fastens on the criminal Kenneth Lay, who may or may not have died of a heart attack just before being sentenced for his crimes in the collapse of Enron and may or may not be living on a 100,000 acre ranch owned by George Bush in Paraguay, cheek by jowl with the biggest American base in the region, just so uh, uh, people who want to look over the fence might be discouraged from doing so. Oh, absolutely. We're now, crowding, we're now crowdfunding for that movie. George I'm Galloway, we got to go to break. It's called, uh, it's called Where's Kenny Boy? And uh, your viewers and listeners, I hope, will go to start, join, and support it.
Okay, George, uh, stay there. Uh, we're going to come back from break, and we'll talk about the film, because I've followed this, and I'm glad you're making it. And I hope folks will support it, because clearly he staged his death two days before sentencing and has been seen down there at the Bush Ranch. I mean, they sheep dipped him, folks. They stage deaths all the time. George Galloway's our guest. Stay with us. We're on the march.